Hello everyone, this is Air, and welcome to the 42nd episode of Death Row Executions. Today's story is on Manuel Manny Babbitt of California, who was executed in 1999 by method of lethal injection for homicide. Manny's story gained attention because he was a war veteran who was diagnosed with PTSD and schizophrenia, and even received medals for his service while on death row. Manny did his time. He, um, he came home after his first tour duty. After his second tour duty, he came home. One day, Manny was in his apartment, and something startled him. A backfire of an automobile, something startled him. He got his little 18-month-old baby, little Manny Jr., and he goes, the bombs are coming, the bombs are coming. We got to get the baby out. Can't you hear it? The bombs are coming. So he snatches the baby, and he starts running. His wife is screaming that this it's pandemonium you know Manny Manny came when Manny came marching home limping f- mentally and morally he, they 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 was able to discern his physical wounds his lips and they was able to patch those up but but they never got around to patching up that war, that wound in his head. So when he left those two tours of duty in Vietnam, he came to America for yet another tour of duty on the battlefield, chasing shadows, imaginary soldiers. Manny Babbitt was born on May 3rd, 1949 in Massachusetts. His parents, Charles and Josephine Babbitt, immigrated from Cape Verde, Africa, and lived in a very poor community. He was one of eight children in an overcrowded living area that had no plumbing or hot water. The only thing that insulated and warmed their living quarters was newspaper and wood. Along with the poor living conditions, Manny's parents were detached from all of their children. Charles was abusive, and his mother was incapable of being present because she was mentally ill. The daily abuse from his father only ended when he died, and by that time, Manny was 14 years old. This event also caused his mother Josephine's health to drastically spiral down as well. It has been said that she would stand outside talking to a pear tree and also wake all of her children up in the middle of the night by screaming as loud as she could for no reason. Growing up, Manny had learning disabilities and, without the proper help, ended up getting held back in school a few times. He was 17 in the seventh grade, and while most teenagers his age were on their way to graduate, Manny lost all motivation for school and ended up dropping out. As soon as Manny turned 18 the following year in 1967, he made the choice to join the Marines. During this time, there was the Vietnam War, and Manny wanted to be able to fight for his country. When he met with a recruiter, he was given an intelligence test, but with not being able to read, he was unable to take the test on his own. Despite knowing this, the recruiter did the test for him, and Manny was soon enlisted. Six months later, he was stationed at the Quezon Combat Base in Vietnam, and his first assignment was loading flechettes into artillery. He could recall seeing nothing but blood and gore. With 6,000 American Marines stationed at the combat base, they, along with air cavalry, were able to kill approximately 15,000 enemies. On our side, 274 Marines were killed, but about 2,500 men from the base were wounded, with one of those men being Manny. He had been fighting for almost two months when he was hit in the head with shrapnel. He was rescued and evacuated in a helicopter that contained body bags of other Marines right next to him. He was taken to get treatment, and just weeks after sustaining serious head injuries, he was flown back to the Quezon Vietnam base to continue on fighting. The battle finally ended in July of 1968, but instead of going home, he went to a different location to fight in another battle. Manny was highly regarded in Vietnam and became a corporal. Once the last battle was over, he signed up for yet another tour, but while waiting, he was assigned as guard duty at a military base in Rhode Island. By this time, he was recently married and began to start a family on base. Unfortunately for Manny, things were never the same mentally after the war. During the Vietnam War, 51% of soldiers were smoking weed, and 31% were using psychedelic drugs that were readily available. A spokesperson for the Bureau of Narcotic and Dangerous Drugs told President Nixon at the time, you don't have a drug problem in Vietnam, you have a condition. Problems are things we can get right on and solve. 
With that quote in mind, Manny continued on with his condition and was frequently taking LSD while working at the base in Rhode Island. While on guard duty, he was equipped with an M16 rifle, and on night shifts, he would spend his time hunting rabbits only to catch them, kill them, and skin them. He would hallucinate being in battle and would often scream for his wife and kids to take cover from bombs like they were being attacked. He then began to miss his shifts, was absent without leave, and then demoted to a private. In 1971, the Army gave him an honorable discharge, and his family was forced to move off the base. Not being able to find a stable job, Manny turned to a life of crime, and by October 1973, he was sentenced to eight years in prison for robbing two gas stations. He was transferred to the Bridgewater State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, a hospital that was recently known for employees abusing patients. Manny was released after eight months, but soon returned to prison on more burglary charges. In prison, Manny attempted suicide because his wife threatened to divorce him, so the prison transferred him back to the Bridgewater State Hospital. It was here where they diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia in 1975. He was eventually let out on parole, but with no place to live was left on the streets with no treatment or medication. A childhood friend said that Manny was never the brightest, but on top of that, he was now crazy. For a short period of time, he tried to get himself together and moved close to his half-brother Charles in Providence, Rhode Island. He even settled down with a woman, but everyone in town knew him as the town crazy. His brother Charles had a bar where Manny would frequent, and many patrons would give him free drugs and alcohol because they wanted to see him act crazier than what he already was. Things weren't going well for Manny, so his brother William Babbitt sent for him to live with him in Sacramento, California. On December 18, 1980, the last thing Manny could remember was that he had spent the night drinking and getting high on weed. He said that he stopped in his tracks when he noticed headlights on a car that reminded him of enemy aircraft lights in his battle at Quezon. It's been assumed that he went back to his time in battle, but the next thing that he can remember is waking up the next morning on a random lawn in Sacramento with items belonging to a woman by the name of Leah Schendel. What happened between the night and early morning of December 18th and 19th that Manny could not remember ended the life of 78-year-old Leah Schendel. Leah had just recently been escorted home by her brother and sister-in-law after spending the evening with them. When her siblings left, they said that they noticed a man walking close by. Manny broke into the senior living apartment complex where Leah was living and broke into her specific apartment by using a knife to cut through her screen door. Once inside, he beat Leah up so bad to where he completely shattered her dentures. He then removed her undergarments, lifted her nightgown that she was wearing over her head, and attempted to rape her but was unsuccessful. Leah was suffering from coronary artery disease, so although she did not die from the beating, she died from the whole traumatic experience because she was so scared, she suffered a fatal heart attack. She was a woman of small stature, standing at 5 feet tall and less than 100 pounds, so she was defenseless against military-trained Manny Babbitt. The night of the 19th, he tried to rape another female victim, and when he wasn't able to, he ended up beating her unconscious and taking her belongings. Manny was soon arrested, and although never denying the murder of Leah, he still had things of hers in his possession and said he could not remember anything. During trial, prosecutors painted the picture that he was a criminal who had offended multiple times and hated women. Defense tried to argue that Manny suffered from PTSD. Manny was evaluated, and on May 8, 1982, he was found to be sane. A couple of months later, on July 6, 1982, a jury found Manny guilty of first-degree murder and felt that he committed the crime in the course of a burglary. They also made a statement that the military did not train him to rape and be a criminal. During appeals, a public defender by the name of Jessica McGuire and a private lawyer by the name of Charles Patterson thought Manny was deserving of a retrial. They felt that the trial was racially biased because the victim was white, there was an all-white jury, the judge was white, and the trial attorney who did not try his best in defending him was as well. They also tried to appeal that the trial lawyer, James Schenck, who had recently resigned from the state bar for embezzling $50,000 from a client's trust fund, had admitted he failed Manny. This same lawyer was also drunk during trial and admitted to having four double shots of vodka while on lunch during trial every day. He was also recorded to have used derogatory words against African Americans and did not object when prosecutors dismissed all of the African Americans in the jury pool. 
No witnesses were brought to the stand to talk about bouts of amnesia and dissociative bouts that stemmed all the way back to the battlefield. It was also not brought up that he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. They felt that if a jury was made aware of this, he would have had a different sentence, but Governor Gray Davis denied Manny's clemency petition. A second clemency was denied by Governor Gray Davis as well. Many supporters of Manny thought wholeheartedly that Manny would be granted clemency because Governor Gray Davis was also a Vietnam War veteran and during elections promised to respect veterans and treat them right. When it came to Manny and his knowledge of his service, Governor Gray Davis made a statement that Manny was a lifelong violent criminal that had multiple run-ins with the law. While on death row, many veterans and citizens came out in support of Manny. Some had come forward to say that Manny had saved their life or that they were on the battlefield with him and they saw his mental health struggles back then. With lobbying from veterans, Manny was able to receive a Purple Heart Medal on death row for his time in the Vietnam War. Walking into a prison room with chains around his wrists, waist, and ankles, Manny heard a sergeant major cite Manny's wounds during the battle. After the speech, Manny tried to salute the sergeant but was unable to because of his shackles, so he ended up bending his body forward so that his head touched his hands. On May 4, 1999, a day after Manny's 50th birthday ended, he was set to be executed by method of lethal injection in a converted gas chamber at the San Quentin Prison in California. He was allowed a last meal with a $50 limit, but he chose to skip his last meal and give it to homeless Vietnam veterans instead. In the moments leading up to his execution, he spent time reading poetry, meditating, and talking to a spiritual advisor. He spoke with his attorney, and many people traveled from all over to see him in his final moments. He was visited by his brother and his fifth grade teacher, Beverly Lopez, who prayed with him and was also able to wish him a happy birthday. Supporters came to the prison as well, and some men had even walked 25 miles from San Francisco to San Quentin for the execution. After being strapped in and asked if he had any last words, he replied by saying, I forgive all of you. Manny died at 12.01 a.m., one minute after his birthday ended, and his body was sent to his hometown in Massachusetts. His body was finally buried on May 10, 1999, with full military honors. Thank you guys for watching, and I would like to give a shout out to Mary Curtis. Thank you so much for joining my Patreon. And now for discussion and question time. After Manny received his Purple Heart, Democratic Senator Diane introduced a legislation that banned military personnel from presenting medals to criminals. What do you feel about this? Do you think it doesn't matter, or do you think that if they deserved it, they should get it? I also know that there have been people found not guilty of a crime after spending 10 plus years in prison for a crime they did not commit. So what if it was a veteran who served, but was innocent or was truly insane and belonged in a mental hospital for criminals? Would it be fair to get a medal then? How do you feel about veterans fighting in crazy battles and dissociating but not getting any help? There are so many veterans on the street and I have witnessed quite a few reenacting something from their battles. Manny was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, but was not given any medication before being left to fend for himself. His mother had mental health issues similar to him, and he couldn't even read, so how far could he get on by himself? This story kind of reminds me of Army veteran Andrew Brannon, who was sentenced to death for killing a deputy by the name of Kyle. So should veterans with mental health issues, who were actually diagnosed and untreated, be given life and sent to a hospital for treatment, or does mental health not matter?